Hello everybody, welcome to number 27. I'm Jack and this is a Daimler Dart SP250. Now this is a car that really didn't have very much going for it, but it does have a very substantial ace up its sleeve. Let's first start with the obstacles that it faced. So when it was first released, the looks were an item for discussion. So much so that at the 1959 New York Motor Show, where it was released, it was unofficially dubbed the show's ugliest car. I can kind of see where they're coming from. It is an unusual design. That snout is very sort of pointy at the front, but at the back, the, the fins mean you have quite a slab side. So it doesn't quite fit. It doesn't quite work. Although there are some angles that are better than others. If that wasn't enough, there was even a problem with the name. It was a car that was designed to appeal to the American market, but when they brought it over there, they realized that the name Dart had already been taken by Dodge. So they quickly had to come up with something else. SP250, a bit generic, a bit boring. It basically meant sports car, 2.5 liter. Perhaps more worrying was that the chassis had so much flex in it that when you went round corners, especially if you hit a bump, it's quite probable that the doors might swing open. Lastly, the general quality of these was so bad that when William Lyons from Jaguar, when they took over this company, even they were quite worried and decided to come up with the revised versions, which were the B and the C. So what was the big ace that I was talking about? has got an absolute jewel of a 2.5 litre V8 engine. Before I tell you more about how it drives, let me just give you a little bit of history about Daimler itself. Obviously Daimler is a German name, but the Daimler British the Motor Company, the rights were taken from Gottlieb Daimler at the beginning of the uh, 19th century to be used for this car company. It otherwise has absolutely nothing to do with the German concern. It was originally the official mode of transport of the British royal family. But at the end of the 40s, they switched to Rolls-Royce after repeated breakdowns in their Daimlers. The decision to make a little sort of convertible sports car was quite an odd one for a company that really made traditionally limousines. When it came out, it was quite unusual to make a small light sports car like this and felt at, what at the time was a relatively big V8. It's only a 2.5 litre, so I guess by American standards, it wasn't a big engine. But it was considered a very fast car, 140 horsepower, 950 kilograms, so much so that the British police used them because they had trouble keeping up and catching the cafe racers that were prevalent at the time, these guys in the motorbikes. And this became an official police car. This has a particularly lovely story, this car, because Stephen, the owner, who also had that absolutely beautiful convertible E-Type that I drove in an earlier video, this has been in his family since it was new. His uncle bought it originally in, I don't know, I would imagine 61 or 60, I didn't ask him the year. Didn't like it and after a year sold it to his great uncle Jack, my namesake. And great uncle Jack adored this car and has left his mark on it. You can see the little Daimler badge on the back isn't supposed to be there, the petrol filler. I think there's a few other little bits. This car is also different because it has what are called the Pullman seats. Normally these have a bucket type seat. Now this is both a positive because I guess it's more, it's a bit more comfortable and a negative because you slide absolutely all over the place. And I think because they're thicker seats for me, makes the driving position quite challenging. I don't know if you can see on the camera, but my left leg is just pinched to the side between the gear change and the dash. It's not a natural driving position for me. I also 
as standard, tend to see the, the windscreen bar at the top, and my head gets buffeted. But this engine is an absolute peach, and we're going to do another pull now, and then we'll talk a little bit about the dynamics, which are supposed to be quite compromised on these. quite long it was just first and second there it's already up to 50 or 60 in second it pulls pretty hard it's a very refined engine so it's very very flexible it develops a bit of a snarl and starts to pull a bit harder around 4,000. The red line is six. I didn't quite get to that. I went to five and a half, which to be honest is plenty. The gear change is, uh, it's very, it's stiff, it's heavy, it's precise, and it's not, I think once you know it, you'd be okay, but it's not the easiest gear change to use, and certainly it will not be rough. Four gears on this. I think some of them had overdrive. But the beauty of it is, it's so flexible, you don't really need to worry about changing gear very much. What strikes me is that although it's quite a light car, it doesn't feel like it. It feels like a substantial heavy car. That's not necessarily a criticism, because it makes it feel like a quality item. Certainly in this, I can't immediately feel any of the chassis flex which the A series cars were notorious for. Like most of these, the steering has been upgraded to a triumph rack and pinion from the original recirculating ball. It makes it more precise, it makes it a bit lighter as well. The steering feel is fine. It is a ponderous feeling car, it's not a dynamic delight. So getting it down a twisty road like this, it doesn't tie itself up in knots too badly, but it certainly doesn't feel like it would enjoy being thrown around too much. The brakes are really responsive. I think they're discs all around. And it's got quite a strange personality because this engine is so incredible, but, the rest of the car doesn't quite match up to it. So you don't really know what it is exactly. Is it supposed to be a Tourer? Doesn't really work as a sports car. But the power plant is just a little jewel. It is unreal. It sounds like a much bigger engine. It has twin SU carbs at the front and they suit it perfectly. SUs give you more drivability really than the Webbers. So, all in all, I think that I can understand some of the criticism that was levelled at this, but as a classic, it is a, a very intriguing prospect. There's a little bit of brake squeal there. The brakes have just been done on this, and I think that they weren't done. Well, something's not quite right there, so it will have to go back for that, but ignore it. It's not usually like that they do stop the car well enough. The interior I find just endlessly charming. Look at this sort of padded dashboard, the way the instrumentation is laid out. The heater controls there I just love. So simple, it's literally hot, cold, and then if you want the, the fans to come on, you just pull it, a little lever, and the fans come on absolutely lovely delicate clear instrumentation no complaints there perhaps if i had the bucket seats i would fit in it a bit better i do think that they might give me a bit more room in terms of styling i'm not sure if this is something i would pick for myself for one of my cars but very much like my own frog eye sprite this is one of those cars that's incredibly endearing because it just seems alive it just screams with personality and it is a car that 
I do like. I mean, that engine, it's all about the engine. The handling is better than I was expecting. I think this has some special locating rods for the rear axle that help a little bit. But the handling, if you don't try and push it, isn't too bad. Um, but certainly this isn't a car which is made to be thrown around. All in all then, quite an intriguing proposition. Thank you so much to Stephen for bringing it down. I've really enjoyed driving it today. It does require concentration to drive. It's not a car you can just sort of bimble around in, but it is enjoyable. Thank you all so much for watching. If you have a car that you would like me to do a review on, please contact me either on Instagram or by email. Really look forward to seeing you for the next video.